Hello again, and welcome back to part two of Decorative Stone Solutions Virtual How to Specify Landscape Ground Cover Stone Series. I'm Randy Jurgensen, the architectural rep here at Decorative Stone Solutions, and today we're going to be going over the ins and outs of specifying stone as a landscape ground cover stone. So the utilization of stone as a landscape ground cover dates back thousands of years and began in an effort to beautify landscape garden areas while at the same time minimizing required maintenance. At a very basic level, nothing has changed since then. Ground cover stone is still used in much the same way and for the same reasons today. Uh, none of the information supplied today is rocket science. I will simply be providing some basic design guidelines and product characteristics. So let's get started. So let's talk a little bit about shape of landscape stone. They're angular and there's round. Um, some of the pros and cons of each angular is typically a blasted material, hard rock quarry type material and round rock is um, screened out of old ancient dry river bed or glacier flows. But angular as a shape tends to lock better than a rounded stone. So it doesn't move underfoot when in a walking area. Um, less migration if you have using blower maintenance or potentially in a high wind area, it does stay put. Um, it is typically less expensive than round rock just because there are more options available, uh, especially here in uh, the southwestern United States where we're a little round rock poor but angular rock rich. And you typically have more color and size options in an angular rock than you do in round rock. Since it is a mechanically produced material, you can go find veins of, of material and quarry those as opposed to just having what nature provided for you in a round rock. Uh, on the round rock side, uh, the, the pros on that are that it does recreate a simulation of a dry stream bed much better than an angular stone. So you get a more naturalistic look there. Um, and it's better for areas where walking, barefoot walking will take place. So if you have a real small pea gravel, you can use a round of a rock and, uh, and walk barefoot there. Like anything else in your design, various sizes, colors, and textures can be mixed to create eye-catching spaces. So don't be afraid to kind of uh, mix things up here. Um, you can use, again, here's a bunch of angular rock in various sizes and colors used to make these um, banding sections. Something like this is uh, is where the same product is used in a variety of sizes. Um, so on the left, you've got the decomposed granite, very small finds. On the far right, you've got the decorative gravel version in like a three quarter to one inch size. And in the middle, you've got some of the rubble riprap in like a three to eight inch and then uh, the boulder size as well. So this very same product uh, can come in sizes from the smallest of DG up to the largest of boulders and anything in between. Uh, I always like to give some what not to do. So if you're calling out um, several sizes, uh, don't be afraid to get creative, but if you do, um, it is a matter of specifying a percentage of this size and a percentage of that size of the ingredients of your mix. Something to consider if a natural look is desired would be to call out sizes that are in the same range, not a very large rock and a very small rock. This particular install shows something that has about a 75% call out of the three quarter inch size of the rock and a 25% of the four to eight inch rock. The two sizes are not similar enough to each other and the results you, you see here are an unnatural look. It's kind of as if the larger rock randomly fell out of the sky one day. So um, a better option would maybe be the two to four and a three quarter inch or the two to four and a four to eight inch. But the difference between a four to eight and a three quarter inch is too great to be able to get a natural mix. Um, Something to consider also is that most quarries are in the business of separating out rock sizes and not combining them. So in most cases, if you call it a custom uh, mix, 
it will have to be blended on the job site by the installation contractor and not come delivered in that fashion from the quarry. Um, so uh, the success of the project, uh, the mixing will often depend on the contractor on hand. Uh, I want to touch on this trend that's been around for quite a few years now, but um, and it's talking about getting uh, towards a larger rock size. So in the past, three quarter to one inch rock has kind of been the benchmark when we're talking about landscape ground cover stone. But uh, we're moving away from that and you see a lot more of larger three inch and up sizes. Why there are certainly some desirable aspects of these larger pea size. I wanted to make sure that I point out that there are some drawbacks as well. So um, what's great about the larger rocks is that it's a, it's a wonderful deterrent to keep people and animals out of an area that, because it's not a comfortable surface to walk on, to loiter on. Um, think about areas where loitering and homelessness is a problem. Uh, it is more aesthetically pleasing texture um, to the eye in larger expansive areas where you have a lot of square footage and you do get considerably less erosion during rain events um, even using larger stones it stays in place much better on the drawback side of things um, larger stone is typically more expensive and there's a couple reasons for that um, typically you need more of it to cover the same square footage so if you had 100 square feet of area and you were using a small three quarter inch rock, you could install it only two or three inches in depth. If you're using a four to eight inch rock, you're gonna need to install it at a seven to eight inch depth. So you're gonna need considerably more stone because of the volume of stone needed. Um, you gotta install 100% coverage depth so that you're gonna need more tonnage um, than you would in a smaller rock. Another reason it's more expensive is that it's more expensive to install a larger stone than it is a smaller stone and because it's not as easy to spread. A three quarter inch rock, you can kind of spread it and rake it out to nice and smooth versus a bigger stone. You typically, there's gonna be some hand placement involved. Um, so there's more, there's more labor involved in the placement. It does tend to also have larger void spaces between the stones, and these tend to collect trash and windblown debris. So something to consider for a little more maintenance on a larger stone um, in that fashion. And then there's always this fear that the larger stones, you know, softball size and up, tend that that they'll be picked up and used for destructive ammunition, you know, thrown through windows and, and such. While that's a concern, uh, I have not seen that happen in reality in my 20 years in the business, but, uh, but it is a consideration. Um, on that line, this is a middle school project that actually had a requirement of nothing smaller than 12 inches in diameter because they did have a fear of kids picking up and throwing rocks. So you either had a very fine decomposed granite and then some larger 12 inch and up sizes. Um, an area where you do get some water flow here, the larger size is good for resisting erosion. And uh, this is just a good example of some bigger pieces that require some hand placement to install, just uh, emphasizing that slightly higher installation costs. Big uh, 12 inch. Uh, and larger sizes used in this turf reduction spot. And this this uh, planter, just there used to be some cow paths here where everyone was shortcut through this parking lot and this larger um, rubble was used here in order to deter that from happening. So it is, like I said, a good deterrent from keeping people out of areas where, where they don't belong. Okay, so we're transitioning a little bit to uh, the use of landscape fabric. So this is specific to using landscape fabric underneath inorganic landscape stone, um, ground cover material. I know it's a little bit of a touchy subject. subject. Some people are, are, are far on one side and the other. I'm simply gonna present my take on the situation. So reasons to use, um, you know, it does, deter weeds, that's the, the really the number one thing. 
um, and reduces the need for herbicide use. It is a great separation barrier where the stone is not going to get pushed down into the soil. Um, you know, again, we're talking about inorganic use, so it's great for landscape rock, not so good for organic mulch. Um, and it does allow for water absorption into the soil, so you know you can keep moisture in the ground for plants. Not to use, uh, it's not as necessary in real arid desert climates where you know weed growth is not a, a big issue because um, it does add an additional cost to the project. And uh, as mentioned, for organic mulches, um, it does slightly inhibit the transfer of nutrients into the soil. So um, better for use uh, in organic mulch as opposed to organic mulches. Um, if you do decide to use a landscape fabric under your rock mulch, uh, I would suggest you follow a couple of these tips for successful insulation. Um, you know, they're not all made the same. Uh, my recommendation is for um, something that is a non-woven product, but is a punched product. So the holes there uh, are perforated and it's a non-woven fabric. Something that's guaranteed for 10 years, don't cheap out on your landscape fabric, you'll regret it. Um, and if you don't already know, do not use plastic. It, it's, uh, it's the worst thing you can do. Um, a couple of installation tips. If you're gonna be uh, moving plants around in a specific area on a frequent basis, not the best idea. Um, you know, if you're using annuals or uh, vegetable areas, the fabric underneath is not a great idea. Um, it does have to be covered. So if it, any part of the fabric is exposed to the UV, you know, you're gonna get um, much more rapid deterioration of the fabric. Um, you know, some people do like to use a pre-emergent in the soil before laying the cloth, uh, so you don't have weeds trying to come up through it. And, you know, just, it does require some maintenance. It's not to put this down and you'll never see a weed uh, again. So just something to keep in mind there. All right, so uh, on to borders and how to border landscape ground cover stone areas. One of the biggest issues with any kind of landscape ground cover material is migration into adjacent areas. I wanted to review the proper use of borders to help minimize the movement of material. So when you're using rock under an inch and a half in size, it's almost always a good idea to use a border of some fashion. Otherwise, the material will tend to migrate into the surrounding areas, creating a maintenance issue. This is especially true with smaller rounded stones, which like to move around on you, get kicked around. Um, so in this image, you'll see uh, see this stone with the side, sidewalk next to it. That's an inch and a half size material. Um, anything inch and a half and above when bordering a walking space like that is a great idea because the probability of that material migration onto the walking surface is minimized. Um, some types of borders, if you are not aware, you know you can do metal, which is steel and aluminum are the most common ones we see out there. Um, you can use poured-in-place concrete curbing. Uh, you'll see pressure-treated wood as an option. And then there's some less expensive flexible plastic edging. Um, while not my favorite, it does have its um, uses. So this just shows uh, this edging between the organic mulch on the right and the inorganic uh, decorative gravel there on the on the left hand side and keeps them from contaminating each other. Examples of concrete mow curbs in this median design um, separating out the materials. Some aluminum edging shown here uh, separating out the various types of stone that were used in this rock mulch. As I mentioned earlier, just want to demonstrate how that migration of small gravel is real. And if installed in an area where foot traffic is present, the result is, as you see here in the sidewalk, is material getting kicked and tracked onto the surrounding surfaces. I will uh, temper a little of this by saying even with borders, you can see that some of the gravel on the right is making its way uh, onto the DG path. And I should say gravel uh, that's on the left is going onto the DG path, which is on the right. 
So I would maybe consider using a larger rock size in this um, installation to deter pedestrians from walking across it and tracking material onto that path. Don't have to use a border. Nothing was used in this particular installation. Just know that it will become a maintenance issue over time with that lightweight organic ground cover on the right that's gonna be migrating in and getting blown into the rock mulch on the left. So it, it, it's not gonna stay put. Um, smaller rock can be used in raids planners where they will not get picked around so easily. So, you know, no need obviously for border here, but that smaller, which is three eighths inch and under size um, can be used in these raised planters that you'll see in these two options. Kind of a neat geometric shaped planter. And we're gonna try to kind of close this by talking about DG used as a ground cover. We kind of covered decorative gravels and rubble and riprap used as a ground cover, but DG is also a popular ground cover that I wanted to make sure you guys understand the ins and outs of that as well. So decomposed granite or DG for short, in case you don't really know what, uh, what that is, so I'm gonna explain. Um, decomposed granite is similar to small gravel, but it contains more fines or rock dust. If you think about a uh, class two road base, which is a three quarter inch and minus, the largest size is three quarter inch and then the minus goes all the way down to, to rock fines. Well, DG is similar to that, except for that the largest particle sizes are three eighths of an inch or sometimes quarter of an inch uh, at the max and they go all the way down to the very fine rock dust particles. The mixture of the sizes in, in the decomposed granite allows for the correct blend of large particles, which provide strength, medium sizes, uh, which are the space fillers in there, and then the fines act as binders to hold, hold the larger and medium sizes together so it's a more stable surface. So once it's wet and compacted, DG um, is harder and more stable than granite, than gravel it won't crumble or become finer over time. And I just want to give a couple terminology things here where depending on where you're at in the country, um, decomposed granite goes by many names and all of them are describing products which basically have the same behavior characteristics as decomposed granite. And some of those terms you might hear are rock dust, crusher fines, disintegrated granite, and chap. All of them are referring to basically the same thing. A couple of the uh, pros and cons on uh, DG is you know, on, the, on the positive side, there's very little organic matter. So weed maintenance is typically minim minimal. You can get almost any color in the rainbow, um, you know, blues, purples, pinks, whites. You can really truly get almost any color. It's a great walking surface if it's a, if it's a maintenance area and it's going to need to be walked on occasionally. You know, it does take foot traffic very well, um, and it really can be used in conjunction with a lot of different hardscape products in order to soften harsh lines and create a real natural appearance. Um, and it, it does lend itself well to blending two different. Um, surfaces together so it can be packed flush to surrounding grade and make for a nice seamless transition. What uh, What is the limitations of decomposed granite? I would say that is using it on slopes is, a, is typically a bad idea because if you have any water running on this, picking up speed, um, it does, it does, it, you will get considerable amount of erosion there. Um, it is always still a good idea to hand compact areas um, to get it nice and settled and tight. Um, so wet and compaction is still a good idea. Uh, it is less permeable than decorative gravel. So because of all the fines that are in included in there, it's not going to drain as freely. It will, it is permeable, but just considerably less permeable than um, decorative gravel. Um, if you have it, let's say, uh, against a building where you have some splash uh, coming off of the roof during a rain event, it can kind of splash some of that color onto the surrounding structures and uh, leave a little bit of staining. So know that that is something that can happen. 
I have heard that people want to put DG in all these areas because how it compacts and does extremely well. It will, it does, but it's not a magical product. It doesn't solve every problem and it shouldn't be used in every application. So I want to make sure that, you know, that there are limitations in, in the product. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up there. Those are the basics for how to specify stone as a landscape ground cover, also referred to as rock mulch in a lot of places. Uh, this tutorial is just meant to cover the most common 80% of the questions we get related to the topic. If you have a scenario in the 20% that wasn't covered or any other landscaping stone related question for that matter, please feel free to reach out to me and I can discuss it in more detail with you. You can see my contact information here. And if you like what you see, be sure to sign up to receive uh, periodic similar content on our website at Decorative Stone Solutions. Remember, this is part two. Stay tuned for part three of this informational series, and we will be covering specifying stone in stormwater infiltration areas. Coming soon.